Hello once again guys, welcome back to the channel. So in this video today, we're gonna to be covering everything you need to know about taxes related to investing in the stock market. So if you earned any income from dividends in 2021, you're going to have to pay taxes on that in 2022. In addition, if you sold off any stocks for a profit, you're going to have to pay taxes on those gains as well. However, as you're going to learn shortly, the taxes that you pay on dividends versus the taxes you pay on capital gains when selling a stock for a profit are very different. So in this video, I'll be sharing everything you need to know about how dividends as well as gains from the stock market are actually taxed and how you can also make sure you're paying the minimum in taxes on your investment income. I'll also be covering how capital losses or selling an investment for a loss can actually offset some of your capital gains and how all of that factors in. Then at the end, I'll be doing my monthly update on my M1 Finance stock portfolio, so stay tuned. Lastly, before we get into the video here, guys, I just have to make a quick disclaimer that I am not a financial advisor, nor am I a tax advisor. And if you have any questions about your own individual taxes, you should consult with an actual tax professional. This is just my two cents as a guy on the internet who has been paying taxes on investments for many years. So starting off here, let's talk about taxes on dividends. So we all know that dividends are essentially a way for a company to share profits with investors. However, the key thing to be aware of when considering taxes associated with dividends is whether or not you are earning qualified or non-qualified dividends. Non-qualified or ordinary dividends are taxed at the same rate as your regular income. Qualified dividends, however, are taxed at the more favorable long-term capital gains tax rate. And depending on what tax bracket you are in, this could be the difference between paying taxes on your dividends versus not paying any taxes at all. Based on the current tax code, qualified dividends are tax-free for single filers making under 40400 per year. That is why it's crucial to understand this. So I'm going to show you the actual IRS table in a little bit here, but first let's cover the difference between qualified versus non-qualified dividends. That way you can make sure you're earning mostly, if not all, qualified dividends for the favorable tax treatment. So in order for a dividend to be a qualified dividend, the following criteria have to be met. First, the dividend must be paid by a U.S. company. However, some foreign companies are included as well as long as they trade in the U.S. or if they have a tax treaty with the United States. Second of all, a minimum holding period has to be met, which simply means there's a period of time you're required to hold on to that stock in order to earn qualified dividends. Now, I'm just going to warn you guys, this is where things get a little bit complicated as things usually do with U.S. tax policies. But afterwards, I'm going to explain this in very simple terms. So don't worry if this isn't really making a lot of sense. So in order for a dividend to be qualified, you need to hold on to the stock for at least 60 days during a 121 day period. And that 121 day period starts 60 days before the ex dividend date for the given stock. And the ex dividend date is simply the cutoff date for receiving the dividend as an investor. So if you purchase the stock the day before the ex dividend date, you yourself get the dividend. However, if you purchase the stock the day after or the day of the ex dividend date, the person that you bought the stock from gets the dividend instead. So it's pretty complicated, but it's based on essentially how long you're holding on to a given dividend stock. So to explain things very simply here, dividends earned from stocks you've held on to for a few months are most likely going to be qualified dividends. If you're somebody who trades in and out of dividend stocks frequently, which isn't very common, you would not be earning qualified dividends if that holding period wasn't met. 
And this whole tax code surrounding qualified dividends is to encourage long-term investing and encourage people to you know, keep their money where it is versus trading in and out of stocks. As you're going to see as well with capital gains, there is a favorable tax treatment for long-term investing. So that is basically the behavior they're looking to encourage here through these incentives. However, there are a few more stipulations related to qualified dividends that you should be aware of. Let's cover those now. So there's a few specific investments out there that do not earn qualified dividends. And the most common are going to be REITs as well as MLPs. That is because these investments have their own unique tax treatment. So they are not simply qualified dividends. And understand those are going to be non-qualified dividends no matter how long you hold on to that investment. So to answer the question of how much you're going to pay in taxes, well, let's start by looking at the qualified dividend tax table for 2021, because that is what most people are likely going to be earning is qualified dividends. So here we have the 2021 qualified dividends tax rate table, and I was able to find this over on The Motley Fool. So you can pause this and see where you would fall in terms of the taxes based on your level of income. But for most people, it's going to be a 15% tax rate. And then if you are earning any ordinary dividends, which could be from short-term ownership of dividend stocks, or perhaps dividends from REITs or MLPs, it's going to fall under this table right here, the 2021 Ordinary Dividend Tax Rate. This was also from the Motley Fool website. So as you can see here, there is a big incentive to earn qualified dividends because for the top bracket, you could be paying as much as 37% taxes on your ordinary dividends. All right, so now that taxes on dividends are handled, let's now talk about taxes on capital gains from buying and selling stocks or, you know, index funds and things like that. So let's say, for example, you put $10,000 into an index fund and then you sold out of it completely later on for $15,000 your capital gain on that investment would be 5,000, and that is the actual amount that you have to pay taxes on. However, if you don't sell, you do not have to pay any taxes on unrealized capital gains. The only thing that you would pay taxes on is the earned dividends. The amount that you're going to pay in taxes on the capital gain from the investment is actually going to be based on how long you have held on to that particular investment. That is because capital gains from stocks are also eligible for the long-term capital gains tax rate. And the good news is this one is far easier to understand than looking at qualified dividends. So if you hold on to a stock or an ETF for 365 days or less, you're going to pay short-term capital gains, which is the same as your ordinary income, the highest possible rate that you're going to pay. On the other hand, if you hold on to stocks or ETFs for 366 days or more, you would now pay long-term capital gains. So in a nutshell, you're going to pay a lot less in taxes if you hold on to an investment for longer than one year. Here is the table showing short versus long-term capital gains for single filers. And this was over on the Financial Samurai website. So feel free to pause this and check it out and look at the difference between short-term capital gains versus long-term capital gains for your particular bracket. And that shows you how much you can save in taxes by aiming to have long-term capital gains. If you earn under 41,675 a year, you effectively pay no taxes on your gains if you hold on to stocks or ETFs for more than a year. However, most people here are going to end up paying 15% taxes on their long-term capital gains. So going long with your investment strategy can literally cut your tax bill in half or for the lowest income brackets, it could mean not paying any taxes at all. And again, this is to encourage and incentivize long-term investing. So moving on, now that we understand taxes on dividends and capital gains, let's talk about how losses factor into the equation. 
And this is obviously going to happen when you sell a stock or an ETF in the given year for less than you had previously paid for it. Now that could be based on an emotional decision, or it could actually be something that you're doing intentionally with a strategy called tax loss harvesting that we're going to explain shortly. So when the year ends and you're looking at statements from all of your different investment accounts, you're going to have a total capital gain for the year, which is going to be the amount that you made from basically buying and selling shares if you made any transactions during that year. And for most people, this is going to be a mixture of long-term capital gains and short-term capital gains. And those are going to be separated out on the statements that you get from your brokerage platforms. Then if you're like most people and you had a few losers that year, you're also going to have your total capital loss, which is how much money that you lost in the stock market in that given year. The difference between those two is going to be your net capital gain, and that is the actual amount that you're going to pay taxes on. So that is one benefit to the stock market is that your losers can offset your winners as long as you follow something called the wash sale rule. We're going to explain the wash sale rule in just a second, but for now, let's just go over a capital gains example. So let's say you had $25,000 of capital gains in 2021 or money that you made from buying low and selling high. We're not going to lump in dividends because that's accounted for separately. But then let's also say in that year, you lost $5,000 on a bad investment and you actually sold it for that loss. You have to recognize the capital gain or the capital loss in order to basically capture it and use it for that tax year. So your net capital gain would be the $25,000 minus the $5,000 loss or 20,000. And that is the amount that you would actually pay taxes on. That's why towards the end of the year, a lot of people actually sell off some of their losing investments because they're looking to offset some of their gains from, you know, uh, investments that did well that year that they sold off in order to minimize their tax bill. Also, many robo-advisors out there do this automatically with something called tax loss harvesting. However, if this is something you're going to do yourself, as I had mentioned, you do have to be familiar with the wash sale rule. This basically states that if an investment is sold at a loss and then repurchased within 30 days, that the initial loss cannot be claimed for tax purposes. So this is basically to prevent people from, you know, selling a losing stock stock on a Friday, trying to rebuy it on a Monday, and then calling that a loss to offset capital gains. You would have to make sure that you don't touch that stock in any of your brokerage accounts for that 30-day window for it to be a legitimate, you know, uh, tax capital loss. So that's the gist of how taxes work with your investments in terms of the taxes you pay on dividends and then capital gains and then how capital losses can offset your capital gains from the stock market. The last thing I want to cover is the other way to minimize the amount of money that you're paying in taxes outside of just going long with your investments and that is taking advantage of retirement accounts. So if you're looking to cut down on taxes aside from going long, your best bet is to invest within a retirement account. So for example, within a Roth IRA, dividends and gains, whether or not they're short-term or long-term, are 100% tax-free. And then with a traditional IRA, they're tax-deferred, meaning that you pay those taxes later. The only downside, of course, here is it's within a retirement account. So with the Roth IRA, for example, you're not allowed to touch the earnings. You know, you can take out your contributions, but you're not able to take the earnings out without paying taxes and penalties. But if you're investing for the long term and you're tired of paying taxes, the Roth IRA is one of the best options that you have available to you. So anyways, guys, that's the gist of how taxes are handled with the stock market. If you are ready to get started with filing your taxes, I am affiliated with eFile. I think I get like, you know, maybe 75 cents or something if somebody uses my link. So if you want to check it out, they offer completely free federal income tax filing. So that can be a good option to use. I also have a full step-by-step -step tutorial I did on how to file your tax return and I'll put that card up in the corner. So now let's jump into my M1 Finance portfolio 
and do my portfolio update. Okay guys, so here we are inside of my M1 Finance portfolio. So let's go ahead and do a monthly update on this now. So the value of this portfolio has been pretty consistent over the last two or three months, hovering right around $100,000. Now, as I had mentioned in many videos previously, a lot of the stocks that I had purchased during the pandemic, pretty much all of them actually, I sold off earlier in the year and I rotated that money into a couple of more concentrated bets. Now, in the short term, that has not panned out very well for me, but you can't judge someone's success in the stock market by looking at even just a couple month window of time. So most of the stocks that I allocated money into were either mid cap or small cap stocks with the exclusion here being my small position in Verizon. But right now, smaller cap stocks have been absolutely crushed in the market. Now, I believe at some point in time, the valuations of many of the S&P 500 companies are going to come down, especially looking at, you know, the top five names or the largest companies out there, including the list of companies involved in FANG. So these companies have really been what is carrying the S&P 500 right now, as well as the NASDAQ. And if you actually strip away some of the largest holdings within the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, you would actually see that overall, many of the stocks in these indexes have not been doing very well at all. So it's really a strange time in the market right now where if you look at the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, you would think that things are pretty good, but when you look beyond just the largest concentrated holdings for those indexes, you see that that's not the case at all. Now, I think that at a certain point in time, we are going to see a rotation out of larger cap names and into smaller cap stocks, but as of now, that has not yet been the case. So let's go ahead and jump over to the holdings tab now and take a look at the performance. So overall here on this portfolio, I am still down around 19% or roughly $23,000. And most of those losses are here with my number one position of Genius Brands. A lot of people have also been asking about my facial hair. So the story behind that is I decided to grow out a beard and keep that beard until this stock hits $5 per share. So I know it's not the most popular thing out there, but that is pretty much the uh, bet that I made with my audience here for fun. Now, there wasn't much in terms of news for Global Partners or Dave & Buster's or Verizon for this month, but we did get a couple of exciting pieces of news related to Genius Brands. So let's jump into that now. So first of all, we got this announcement right here that Genius Brands Cartoon Channel is going to be launching on JetBlue Airlines as part of their in-flight entertainment. And this is sort of funny to me because I actually fly JetBlue all of the time uh, because my main residence is down in Miami and I visit you know family and friends in New York quite a bit. So we were just flying up for Christmas on JetBlue and it was pretty funny because a day before my flight, this announcement came out about them offering a cartoon channel as part of their in-flight entertainment and I believe that is going to launch sometime in January now I think this is a really cool idea because most people when they're flying are going to be watching something on the screens and especially for kids you know it's good to be able to put something on that way they're not annoying you during the flight and I think this is a really great way for people who might be totally unaware of Cartoon Channel to learn about the different shows and then hopefully download the app, which is the streaming platform, after their flight. So I'm excited to see how this pans out and hopefully there are more future partnerships like this to just get more people you know, aware of the content over on Cartoon Channel. There was also the announcement here in December of the acquisition of a German company known as Your Family Entertainment, which is going to effectively give Genius Brands control of one of Europe's largest animation catalogs and children's broadcasters. So it's really cool to be seeing uh, Genius Brands growing here in the United States, but also focusing on their global footprint and turning into a global children's entertainment company. So this was also really exciting news and I'm excited to see how they end up using these new assets uh, in order to grow the business. 
So the plan here is to rebrand this company as Genius Family Entertainment. And just to show you the overall reach that this company has, YFE currently controls over 4,000 animated episodes and feature films with distribution throughout its streaming and linear kids channels across 100 countries with more than 50 million households reached, including free-to-air, pay TV, and digital subscription channels in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Also, we found out here that Paul Robinson, who was the former managing director of Walt Disney Television International and senior vice president of Disney Channel Worldwide, is going to be joining the company as managing director of Cartoon Channel Worldwide. It's really remarkable when you take a look at the talent involved with this company, and not to mention just the sheer number of ex-Disney people that are now working for Genius Brands. So obviously these are people who know the business very well, and I'm excited to see how they grow this global footprint for Cartoon Channel. Also, if you are looking to get started with investing over on M1 Finance, I do have a completely free 30 minute video training that I'm going to link down in the description below. It's going to walk you through step by step how to create an account with M1 and build an overall portfolio. So if you guys want to check that out, there is a link down below and there's also an affiliate link if you want to sign up with M1 Finance. But anyways, guys, that's going to wrap up this video here talking about investment taxes as well as my portfolio update. So we're going to be updating every single month here and covering, you know, different topics related to dividend investing or investing overall. So if you have any questions that you want me to answer in a upcoming video, be sure to let me know down in the comment section below. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. Be sure to check out M1 Finance via the links in the description below. And and as always, I hope to see you in the next video.